We are now live, so attendees can join us. And the recording has started. So now everything you will say will be on the record, and we cannot wait to hear everything. And our attendees are piling in as well. We're already up to 10-ish, which is very exciting. Hello, everybody, and welcome. We're getting started in the next three minutes. Can you hear me on this microphone? Yes. OK, great. Yes, we can, Amy. Just as a note, we had 151 people register for today's event, and wow. Eventbrite promoted it as one of the best events for the day. Bravo to you guys. Great. I shall uh, update that number. I think uh, last time I looked at it, it was 163. So, oh, so uh, thank you all for uh, including us in your network outreach as well. And thank you to Eventbrite. I don't know if we've had that before with our, our 5G event series, have we, Tim? Nope. Hopefully first of many. Yep. All right, we're gonna have, I assume, a lot of people pile in uh, in the first few minutes of the actual session itself. Uh, so I'm not going to, you know, wait around too long. I am gonna get started right as soon as we can because of course we wanna hear everyone's presentations. We don't want to have any time cut off. We want to hear from everybody. And we're up to, again, just over up at, at 15 people now. So more and more people are coming in. Um, and yes, everyone who is joining, feel free to throw a welcome in the chat. We're hoping, hoping that all of you will be engaged with that as we go on today. Uh, we are looking for questions from you all for our presenters uh, as we move along. And we definitely want you to be engaged throughout. So please feel free to post anything in the chat you want, except for links. Uh, we don't want you to post links in the chat just in case for spam reasons. Uh, so everything else is perfect. Say how much you like something, say how much you have questions about something and go from there. All right, we're up to 20 attendees and it is now 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I think uh, we can get started. Everyone ready? All right, cool. I take your silence and single thumbs up as we are ready to go. Uh, well, hello, everybody. My name is Liam Flanagan. Welcome to our first uh, Invest Ottawa Encore 5G demo days. Uh, I am a program coordinator at Invest Ottawa, working with our advanced technology programs, including the Encore 5G program. And today we have four fantastic companies and a keynote to tell you all about how 5G can be used today uh, and how it will be used in the future. Um, we have a number of exciting things, as I just mentioned, and we're going to be starting things off with Amy Karam, our keynote, who's a TEDx speaker, strategy consultant, and 5G thought leader. Uh, so she'll be doing a talk just before we get into the presentations. And we're going to be talking about some real tech here with four Eastern Ontario tech companies uh, who have participated in the Encore 5G program uh, with Encore 5G, Invest Ottawa, and OCE, the Ontario Centres of Excellence. The companies today are Incuvers, uh, Kings Distributed Systems, and Massive and Redlore. Uh, so we have the four CEOs of those companies here, which is very, very exciting for all of us. Each company has 11 minutes to present their business and hopefully answer some questions from all of you. So please use your chat and write in questions that you have for each and every one of our presenters today. And hopefully if their pre presentations are shorter than 11 minutes, we will jump in and get to ask them some of your questions. Uh, so that should be pretty fun. Throw them in the chat throughout the event. After all that, we're going to hear from Rebecca Thompson with Invest Ottawa as well to hear about all the capabilities we have 5G and beyond at our Area X.O site, which I'm sure a number of you have heard about. There was a self-driving vehicle going around recently and a big media splash around the renaming and rebranding and revitalization of that site. Uh, so I can't wait to hear about that from Rebecca at the very end of today. So that is what today looks like. I'll be on hand to talk to you all in the chat and welcome our speakers as we move along. But to really get things started, we are going to have a one minute quick welcome from Tim Warland, uh, who's the manager of the 5G program here at Invest Aqua. So Tim, you can kick things off. Thanks, Liam. 
I appreciate the introduction. Well, today is U.S. Thanksgiving, and normally we're busy selling and promoting our goods to our U.S. customers. So today is a chance for us to look locally and focus on some of the local businesses that work on uh, great technology here in our city. Uh, Invest Ottawa is supported by the Ontario Centers of Innovation, formerly known as the Ontario Centers of Excellence, and the Encore system, which can, consists of uh, Talis, uh, Ericsson, and Sienna, and IBM. So we'd like to thank them for their support in, in helping us bring together 5G demo event today. In Invest Ottawa, we've got two complete 5G networks, one at our head office in, in Bayview Yard near downtown Ottawa, and another one on the outskirts of town at Area X.0, and Rebecca Thompson will talk to you about that. Access to use these 5G networks for test purposes is open to any company in Ontario. Get in touch with myself, Liam, or anyone from Ontario Centers of Innovation to find out more. 5G networks create a unique business opportunity. It's an innovation network which requires uh, an ecosystem uh, to develop all the uh, elements for success. And to that end, I'd like to welcome Amy Karam to speak about uh, 5G networks. Amy Karam is a 5G thought leader with a great deal of experience, and I'd like to uh, turn it over to Amy at this time. Thank you. Hi, Tim. Thank you all for, uh, for the invitation. Uh, this is a very important event and one of my favorite topics, of course. Um, and I'm excited also to hear from the innovators that are making 5G happen. Uh, so let's dive right in. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, where we've come from uh, in, in mobile uh, communications. So 2G brought us text messaging, 3G brought us the internet, and then 4G uh, brought us Netflix, Facebook, and Uber. Um, and we, all, we thought all of that was a really great progression along, along the generations. Uh, but 5G is not just another G. Right? It, it is unique and revolutionary in what it can enable. And while it is the next generation of mobile technology, 5G has become a unique leapfrog of possibilities in the evolution path. So 5G essentially means revolutionary change for 5G adopters. Um, so what can we bring to uh, 5G users uh, in particular and society in general with a network that is, as I'm sure you've all heard over and over in a lot of the marketing, 10 times faster, five times more responsive, supports a million IoT devices per square kilometer and is ultra reliable. What does that really mean to users? So what it means is that we can bring amazing solutions to communities. We can reduce greenhouse gases with smart traffic systems that leverage video analytics. We can enable electric autonomous transit systems. Um, and these solutions really cut to the heart of making cities smarter. A lot of us heard, have heard of smart cities. These are some of the ways that um, the needle has moved in that di in dimension. So it can bring drone technologies, soil sensors, and connectivity to farms as well. We've heard a lot about agriculture, and, and that essentially helps make food supplies safer and more secure. We can enable uh, remote diagnostics and virtual care to make healthcare more accessible. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen uh, an accelerated need for that, right? A critical need. And in the future, of course, we've heard about enabling cars to drive themselves and Invest Ottawa is a great place to, uh, to demo that. And I think we're gonna hear about that today. So, um, and of course the ecosystem is more important than ever in making these unique and revolutionary 5G use cases happen because of the complexity involved. So uh, you don't get revolutionary without a lot of steps in between. Um, but it is important to realize that the five, that 5G is really just a journey. Um, it is not a destination. We see a lot of marketing that 5G has arrived, um, but you know what, we've just, we're just getting started. So the network is the fundamental foundation of 5G. It is the highway, right? The smoother, the faster, the wider the highway is, the more that it can be used and in different ways by different users for different reasons. Um, however, uh, because the possibilities of 5G applications are so unique and complicated, it requires a combination of players in the value chain to really make the use cases happen for users end to end. And that's where startups come in, right? So the ecosystem is essential in making 5G happen. Um, and that's why the, the innovators, the creators, you, um, come in to figure out how the amazing 5G highway can be uh, leveraged across the board. So we see 5G use cases. Uh, we, uh, you know, I'm working at TELUS right now um, on 5G Thought Leader. 
leadership. And we're, we see um, them happening in two phases, 5G, uh, as 5G uh, network capabilities evolve, right? So we have opportunities where 5G will enhance or evolve existing use cases where um, 4G LTE uh, enables certain applications today. And then we get into the revolutionary use cases once uh, I call it once, once the network becomes 5G full throttle, right? Once all the feature sets are actually in place. But another key factor is uh, of, of making 5G successful is really the end user approach to figuring out how to capitalize on the possibilities um, that, that 5G can en enable. So it's really, at TELUS, we're taking a problem solving and an outcomes based approach. How can we translate the so what relevance of 5G tech technology into meaningful outcomes for customers? And again, that comes back to the need for partners in the ecosystem to make this value chain happen. So uh, TELUS has had this vision uh, for some time. It's invested in end user solutions like TELUS Health, ADT Security, and more recently you might've heard uh, with the agriculture uh, launch. And thank you, Tim, for your background to reinforce that, um, as well as AI, et cetera. But in, in order con to continue on this momentum, we are looking forward to learning more about the startups that are presenting here today, um, as well as others, right? We're, we're combing, um, combing all the startups, innovators, accelerators, um, in order to uh, figure out how we can work together and make 5G successful uh, together. So congratulations again on this great event and thanks for making me a part of it. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Amy. That's fantastic. And I think the perfect welcome to what we're talking about here today, which is people applying what you just spoke about to real businesses and real opportunities out there in the world. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, folks, you can now change your view up in the top right. You can change from speaker view to gallery view if you wish. I believe I changed it for everyone as the host. It's always fun to have that power. Uh, and now after that fantastic welcome from Amy, we are going to jump right in to the presentations. Uh, so Incuvers is first up with their CEO, Sebastian Hagentonio. I was going to tell us a lot more about their small footprint incubator uh, that helps research, researchers uh, share massive cell uh, data without the, without the risk of contamination and more. And I'm positive that I'm butchering what it is that Sebastian does. So I can't wait to hear from him. Sebastian, you got 11 minutes. And don't forget, folks, post your comments for Sebastian in the chat uh, and you can take it away. You're on mute to start. <laughs> My bad, sorry. I muted you earlier. You're still on mute there. Uh, can you see my screen share? Is it is it proper? Screen share looks good for me and we can hear you loud and clear. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be among you. My name is Sebastian Hedge Antonio and I am co-founder and CEO of Incuverse. So to give you a bit of a background, oh, there we go. Uh, I did my PhD at the University of Ottawa in cell biology. My uh, entire six years there were spent babysitting cells. And that essentially meant that I went into the lab every day and I would go into the incubator, which you see on your left, which is where we grow them. And I would take them out and put them on the microscope so I could actually see how they were doing. And this would have to be done either every day or every few days to actually even get an understanding of how they're doing. And this workflow hasn't changed for 135 years. And one of the major problems that this arises is that you actually don't know how your cells are doing in real time and also compared to what everyone else is doing. And this has actually led to one of the major problems in science, which is the irreproducibility problem. Over 50% of all the publications on cancer work and stem cell work are tried by another group around the world and they fail to reproduce the results that were acquired. And in the United States alone, that was a loss of over $8 billion on irreproducibility. And the strategy we've kind of moved forward for the entirety of science has been peer review and manual and, and protocols and, and publishing on these journals. But the problem with that is that only happens every four to five years, it takes time for someone to try it. And then you kind of you know, reset the clock. And this is really in business, this is anti-lean strategy thinking. And so our mission at Incuverse is to connect every scientist around the world in real time to accelerate discovery. 
So how do you do that? How do you connect every researcher? And we believe you do that through revolutionizing the one system that every researcher has, which is the incubator. And this is IRIS, Incuverse's real-time imaging system. It combines the incubator that grows the cells, the microscopy that visualizes the cells, and large-scale cloud computing and IoT technology to connect them all into one. And so with this, it allows a researcher to, at any given point, to log on to his phone or his uh, desktop platform and start getting live viewing and live analytics on the performance of whatever is going on. And then with time, of course, and as the community grows, not only do we start to, not only do they start to receive their own data, but we start to analytically compare how their results are deviating from the growths and observations of other community members in the community. And so this gives you an instant understanding, you know, of, of an experiment that might take a month, within three days, you know that something is already different or wrong, saving time and excessive amounts of money. With time, in addition to that, we start understanding what people are using as reagents or products. Now, this is a very, very big thing because there are thousands of different products that are used to commonly uh, perform similar experiments. But there's a lot of assumptions going on. And these products will, in the end, affect the outcomes, but we don't know how, because there's just too many permutations. So by centralizing this data, we actually can immediately understand the patterns and differences that are being observed with similar experimentation. And of course, with time, uh, the platform becomes the, the YouTube of cellular research. Now, we may not be getting a billion views a day, that's not the point, uh, but it actually becomes a, a very, very useful resource for researchers to be able to log on and to understand immediately visually and data-wise what they can and should expect. Uh, I should note, you, you, know, you don't have this experience doing it yourself, but the way we do it now is you look at a paper that was published seven years ago uh, in black and white, you, you take a look at it and you kind of judge whether yours look the same or not. And, and you hope they're physiologically the same. So that, it needs a bit of updating. And so one of the major problems that we've already encountered and that we will continue to encounter as we move forward is that scientists and industry don't want or trust their data on the cloud. Um, some, some of them have presented it as not being a problem. Others that are doing very you know, IP related things or, or private companies will not want that data being outsourced onto our Amazon AWS servers. And of course, in addition to that, the cost of storing this data is immense. We're talking at the moment in our first generation system, you're looking at files that measure in the gigabytes. But with our next generation system, you're talking about files that are measuring into the 100 gigabytes or more. So in terms of storage and storing this data, it becomes extremely expensive. And so it came to us, uh, we had the opportunity to work with, uh, with Ericsson and Invest Ottawa, where what if we didn't have to store that data? What if rather than being cloud storage, we were cloud access? And that meant that every bit of data was centralized and stored on a RAID hard drive in the lab, safe and secure, but that we would connect the system and all the various incubators connected to it via a 5G network so that we could get rapid access and instantaneous um, usage of that data whenever and however the user wanted it and, and in addition to us. And so this became actually really, really important. Um, and in fact, I can give you an example of, of one of the customers that we've sent to today. Um, he's having an enormous amount of problems with Wi-Fi. He's, the, the, the research institute doesn't want us to use their Wi-Fi. So he's had to go through the logistics of trying to get a, an ethernet set up. And if you've ever been in an institution, let me tell you, that's a problem. And so having 5G, we were kind of, there are maybe solutions that you could bring forward within your own companies, but having uh, you know, locked networked um, dongles between system and network where that connection is highly secured and not, you know, uh, not being able to be break, breaking in by anyone else would be extremely valuable to us, especially on the business level, uh, because now you're correcting secured connections, which, which allows a lot of freedom. And so to kind of summarize, you know, at 10,000 customers, we're looking at 
10 terabytes per user, um, or sorry, one terabyte per user. But that is in our initial system. Uh, that will start to grow to 10 terabytes, to 100 terabytes. And so you can imagine for us, cloud storage would be very difficult, but having instantaneous access on local data through 5G networks would instantly remodel our business model. And it would be extremely valuable. Um, storing five petabytes of annual on, on Amazon cloud servers, we're looking at 3.6 million alone. So the money it saves for us and the security it offers our customers would be immense. Um, for us, this is really the new opportunity of a new network. You know, you're, you're actually, you're, you're replacing Wi-Fi now. Uh, and so that's actually going to be really interesting to see how that transition occurs. Now, of course, that may not be the case in consumer products. Maybe it is, I don't know. But on a business level, when you have these types of high data bandwidths and security importances, um, it's critical. So uh, we're, we're actually really looking forward to how you guys are evolving your 5G networks and, and the products and IoT dongles and systems that are associated with that because it infinitely uh, facilitates our integration into the labs and the potential of our business model uh, to reduce costs and, and, and optimize uh, our analytics and in our entire networks. That's Incubers. I'm more than, oh. to, uh, more than happy to take on questions. Amazing, Sebastian, thank you so much. Uh, we haven't seen any questions come through in the chat, but especially now, folks, if you have any, throw them out there. Uh, I can start with one. Uh, how exciting is it to to be the the YouTube of yeah. research in the future? Like you're essentially creating a huge opportunity for open source and other forms of collaboration. How excited does that make you? And what could you see happening in the well, future? Uh... I mean, it's obviously extremely exciting because I think there's a there's a growing movement among scientists that this data, to begin with, everything they do is tax funded, is, is publicly funded. So the idea that we're paying for the research and then they publish it into a publication that is then locked where we have to pay $50 to observe what we paid for is insane. I mean, it's truly, that's it's, it's hilarious, to be honest. It's the greatest scheme of all time. <laughs> Um, so, so that data is, is, is funded by you, is funded by I, and you should have access to it. And if that is, you know, peaking curiosity, if you want to learn more about whether it's COVID, whether it's vaccines, whether it's, um, I think the scientific, um, illiteracy is growing and, and, uh, having access to data and, and science freely, uh, is not only a, a privilege, but a right. That's awesome. And, and really hits on a number of things. Like I know right now doing my master's, the way I get articles is I reach out to the author and I say, hey, do you have a copy? And they can sometimes send it to you, but it is, there is, there's a lot of things locked down that your technology could potentially help open up. And I should also note that like, on the other end of the spectrum, the researchers that are sharing this data, they become, you know, they become the, the figurehead for whatever protocols or data they're sharing. So, mm -hmm. you know, they become the face of, oh, well, what protocols are you doing? Oh, well, I'm using the, you know, the, uh, the Stromishnikov protocol because that's the one that's most popular and, and that's the one that's gotten traction and, and people are criticizing it the most because everyone's seen it and everyone's testing it. Uh, as opposed to the very, very siloed strategy right now where it's one publication among 15,000 and the reason you chose it was because it was free and the other one wasn't. Um, and that's really not a great way to do science. That is fair. So we do have one question in the chat. You have 30 seconds to respond, which may be impossible. I'll throw it out to you now from Aaron, uh, who asks, are you using a 5G model directly into the device? If so, were there any certification considerations that had to be taken into account? So we only did prototyping with the 5G dongle that was available to us. It was also confined within the limitations of Invest Ottawa. Uh, so we are not using it at the moment but we would be highly interested in having a 5G, literally a 5G dongle that connects it to an ethernet port and then a 5G reception system in our incubator so that they communicate directly and it's a secured high data throughput line that would solve already problems that I'm having and I've only got a few customers. So I'm, <laughs> I'm scared of what happens when I start getting into the 10, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 customers and all the various permutations of how institutions feel that they, you, you know, you need to do it with their IT services. So mm -hmm. uh, not yet, but if you can give us that dongle, it's in. 
All right, Aaron, there's your answer. And thank you so much, Sebastian. A lot of interesting things ahead and we can't wait to hear more. So thank you, amazing presentation. We're gonna move right on to the next, which is Dan uh, with KDS or King's Distributed Systems. Uh, KDS is a platform that aggregates underutilized CPUs and GPUs. Dan, do you wanna give the full explanation? Because again, I do not wanna butcher this. Liam, thank you. And I didn't forget to unmute myself. I'm uh, constantly <laughs> doing that. First, um, I want to say thank you to OCE and Encore 5G. They've done unbelievable work to, to support us in our, not just uh, in prototyping, but also in our entire journey. You know, the, the connections to other people doing interesting stuff have been invaluable. My name is Dan. I'm a physicist. I uh, did a lot of computational electromagnetics. I spent most of my time actually flying the big C-130s for search and rescue uh, in Canada. Uh, and so I come at this not as a salesman, but I just want to share something cool today. Um, we're now a team of 27. We very much started as three in a kitchen and now are uh, 27 in a nice renovated office here in Kingston. So it's the Silicon Valley of the North little journey here, which we're, we're quite proud of. And we're building software that essentially uh, can um, compose compute infrastructure um, from anything, from a, a Tesla car, which we've used, all the way up to a fridge, to an enterprise server, to all the excess capacity in uh, telecom style data centers like Sengen, um, EGI in Europe, uh, we're, we're scavenging compute successfully uh, without interfering with native application workloads from devices and data centers everywhere. Okay, so I'll take a step back. Um, I need to do a lot of compute, I'm a physicist, and I, I just wanted to be able to write my, my code and just send it. I didn't wanna spend three hours learning how to manage instance types or configure environments or anything else. I just wanted to write my for loop and I wanted to say go. Uh, fast forward three years and that's exactly what we have. But now it's not just useful for physicists, um, it's useful for other startups who are spending a stupid amount of money on cloud or um, uh, scientists of course in universities or enterprise or what have you with a lot of image processing, hyperparameter optimization, blockchain, mathematical finance, arbitrary workloads. Um, I think the best way to, to show this off is I just wanna show you my little physics app uh, and we'll create an instant compute network using everyone in the audience today. And then the obvious connection to 5G here is that uh, bigger pipes will allow for bigger problems to be solved faster. Okay, so I kind of skipped my slides here because they're just, they're just visual aids, I'd rather talk. All right, consider this um, little web page. And by the way, realize that there's no MATLAB, there's no software download installed. There's no expensive license. It's just a website, which means me sharing this with anyone in the world is instantaneous and free. Uh, this website, all right, like any website can look like anything you want. And this one we made look like a paper because why not? And in it, uh, my favorite thing here is Maxwell's equations being solved to produce some interesting um, mathematical solutions describing a floating, or I should say hovering electromagnetic coil above a hyperloop type coil geometry. Uh, the math is, was pretty gory to develop, but the real victim here was in me, was, it's my computer, because <laughs> I then uh, throw at it these numerical integrations that I have to do over and over and over and over again. So again, in this interesting paper, um, we've made it interactive so that anybody can actually open this, any reader, even if they're non-scientists, and they can start playing with um, the, the numbers here. You can see it's all the physical parameters and so on and so forth. Um, today, we're gonna create a compute cloud made up of just our devices, everyone in this audience. Um, we're gonna execute the computations and we're gonna visualize the results. Um, it's just using it over normal web traffic right now, but uh, with 5G, we could send even bigger workloads. And I'll, I'll get into that as a segue. Okay, so I hit compute, it goes to our, um, our scheduler automatically in the background. Um, and now I just need workers. So I invite you all on any device that you're choosing, I don't care whether you have a, a Mac or Windows or anything else, open dcp.mn and hit start. As soon as you do that, your engine or your, your browser engine will grab tasks, execute them and send results back in real time. The more people that do this, the faster this goes. And you can see this progress bar just did dip, 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 dip. That's because we have a couple of computers connected. So if everyone connects, this goes much faster. So what this means and what we've done with this is we've deployed this technology um, across a couple of university campuses here in Canada 
And uh, we're also deploying it right now in Kenya. Uh, and we're expanding to all of Africa. The whole point is to give this technology away for free to academia, to be able to leverage uh, sustainably infrastructure they already have that is underutilized. And we're commercializing with enterprise and industry in order to accelerate um, their image processing, their automatic drug discovery, what have you, arbitrary compute workloads. And there we have it. My results are back here and they were all computed using all of your devices just now. Um, to take the story a little bit further, a little bit more applied, um, deceptively simple developer tools. So five lines of code allows you to tap into this distributed supercomputer. Two lines of code turns any device like we just did into a compute node. Okay, applied. Let's do this. Let's do something a little bit more interesting with the use case. Um, there's of uh, another wonderful startup called AI Sites out of uh, Kingston, um, led by Kiana Yeatman, and she is building a machine vision application uh, that runs on our, our distributed compute platform, but in a secure on-prem um, uh, framework. So the technology I just showed you, it, it worked in a public sense all over the internet, but we can also restrict it to work within the walls of a hospital, or in this case, an egg barn in a smart agriculture application. So Kiana has built uh, a machine vision uh, application that deploys on DCP that leverages all of the uh, computers and uh, x86 devices and what have you um, within um, a farm environment. Um, obviously pushing video feeds all over the place via 5G, executing them and sending the results back to a central management system that controls the speed of the, um, the belts and the elevators in order to um, minimize egg collisions and damage and maximize uh, throughput. So this is a very specific bespoke application, but think about the number of startups that can cut their cloud costs down by up to 95% by using um, our platform uh, on-prem, which also provides that data security aspect. So I'll stop sharing here. What we're doing um, is putting uh, cloud in a jar type technology at everyone's fingertips, free for students, researchers, and academics all over the world. Um, and for industry innovators, what we're doing is we're cutting down the cost of, the cost of cloud by about 95%. More money in people's um, pockets means, or in, in these uh, startups means they can put more money towards product development, going to get more clients, and we can accelerate the economy reboot. Um, we're excited about uh, partnering with uh, telcos. We're working with one out of Singapore because they can use our, um, our NJAR platform in order to serve um, the area, their, their local areas, uh, companies and, and uh, people in need of compute power rather than having external cloud providers come in. So essentially uh, the distributed computer is a bank on top of a distributed compute system that allows metered resource uh, provisioning and consumption. Okay, um, that was short and sweet. Are there any questions? All right, Dan, thank you so much. And yeah, I, I, I love the idea. I love how we're in this university research mode right now because there's a lot of computers that go <laughs> unused on the day-to-day -day in a university. We do have a great question from uh, Steve Onions, I believe, who asked the question, you addressed it a little bit. Uh, he said, how do you manage the cybersecurity risk of connecting random devices together? Does this generate a huge attack surface? So. Go ahead. So, absolutely. So security, we could go down that rabbit hole for eight hours and I had, I'd love to do that on the slide at some point. So uh, really quickly, right now, any one of you right now in your homes could uh, Google uh, illegal Russian alien autopsy and you'll come up with some pretty weird links that will probably be listed. And you could probably go and click on any one of them uh, with 99.99% uh, certainty that unless you download and install something which you really shouldn't, if you're just surfing the web, um, what you're doing is you're loading content from arbitrary locations around the world and you're executing it in the browser's sandbox environment and you're displaying it. A lot of money, billions of dollars have been put in over the last uh, few decades uh, by the, uh, the, the big web uh, providers in making their sandboxes uh, very secure and high performance. And so the demonstration we did today leverages all of the performance and security that's been put into web technology um, over the last several years. Um, and it's just the beginning. So if you want me to take this one way further, we've also taken the, the JavaScript runtime environment out of the browser, which is in this case, Google's V8 engine, and we've wrapped it with uh, only four extra primitives. Read a line from standard in, write a line to standard out, set timer and die. 
this means that the this uh, standalone DCP worker agent has no disk access, no network capability. All it can do is take inert text in, execute, take the result, push it back out as inert text. That's it. Okay, amazing. And we have a minute and a half left. So I'd love to get to another question we have from uh, Malik or Mel, uh, who asks, how is isolation handled? Uh, is it a multi-tenant system? Yes. So essentially we we're calling them compute groups. Um, every, everything is uh, designed with, obviously from the ground up, uh, it's secure by identity. Uh, so we're using public private key pairs to essentially uniquely identify and authorize um, different providers of compute to belong to different compute groups and different deployers of compute workloads to be able to deploy to those compute groups. So let's use a university, for example, we can combine one compute group that only stands for Queen's University. Within it, we can define subgroups for chemistry, uh, physics, math, and so on and so forth. And then we can even create compute groups of only one, which is just one computer. So imagine um, complete fine-grained control over access permissions, almost like group policies um, that allow different computers to do different things based on their permissions. Same thing for the deploy roles. Really cool. That's incredibly interesting and a really good question too. Isolation will definitely be important for this moving forward. There's another great question from uh, Aaron in the chat, but we are out of time. So Dan, I'll get you to, uh, to take a look at that in the chat. Maybe you can type up a response or send a message to Aaron. Uh, we'd love to see it in there. Uh, and thank you for your time. That is your 11 minutes. Uh, so again, I promoted Dan. You can go up in the top right and change things to gallery view if you'd like. Uh, but we're going to jump right into our next presentation, which is from Massive. We have Greg Wood on the horn here, who's now sharing his screen with quite a great uh, thing there. And I will just say before Greg comes in and corrects me that Massive is the fastest and most reliable way for videographers and creators to deliver massive time critical files between clients. Uh, so Greg, you can expand on that and tell us just what the heck is going on uh, with that. Oh, I, I, I think you said it, Liam. And so thanks for that in, in, uh, introduction. I, I don't need to say any more uh, than that, I guess, uh, about what we do. I will say that like Bruce Dickinson, you see here, uh, we Massive does work with media entertainment. And so that means that uh, today we're dealing with the, you know, millions of people who are creating content for consumption today. So as you get everyone here can appreciate, streaming services have exploded, video entertainment has exploded. And during the pandemic, this has been particularly uh, relevant because, you know, everyone's sort of watching it. Uh, but the creation of that video entertainment has really been evolving in recent years. And, uh, and that's the market that Massive plays in. As, uh, as Liam suggested, we're involved in the movement of truly enormous content. And when I say that, we're talking about uh, terabytes of video. Any, any files above 20 gigs or 100 gigs is basically the ballpark of where Massive lives. And, uh, and that means, uh, you know, video because there's so many, uh, so much high resolution video moving around today. Um, and the interesting thing here is that even before the pandemic, uh, video production was moving uh, toward remote work. We're seeing more outsourcing of video creation work. We're seeing more global workflows where you might have a, a video shoot in the UK and you might send it to a colorist in Singapore and then it might come back to Hollywood for streaming. And, um, that was already creating some bottlenecks for video producers, this movement of huge files around the world. But this got particularly uh, egregious when, we, when the pandemic struck, because all of a sudden now everyone was a remote work team and everyone was faced with the fact that we haven't really evolved the way we move files. Uh, in this market, we're addressing this problem by shipping hard drives, still very reliable, right? But you got to literally put uh, files on a drive and then put that in the courier and and send it. Uh, there's UDP software here, which is very fast, but uh, complex, expensive, uh, often office based. Uh, and of course, the old standby FTP has been around here since the dawn of the internet. But again, con internet congestion, and it's a little bit complicated for folks. There's even hardware bonding here, which allows you to use uh, hardware to basically take advantage of multiple internet connections so you can send content from the field or from remote locations or remote offices. And that really was the inspiration for our solution. Uh, we already send files over a highly reliable and very fast uh, uh, cloud network as Liam suggested. 
but when it comes to sending this truly enormous content uh, from remote locations and remote workflows, we thought, you know what, the answer here is simply to add more internet. So we went and built the ability to bond multiple simultaneous internet connections to help accelerate uploads when you need it. And uh, while that means you can bond Wi-Fi or you can bond uh, wired internet, where things get super interesting is with the arrival of 5G, because all of a sudden we're able to add uh, multiple 5G connections to really deliver enormous files in a very short amount of time. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about remote, remote show locations here. You, as you put yourself in the position of a filmmaker, maybe you're out in the field, you're shooting content at 4K, 6K, or even 8K now, and uh, then you need to get that video somewhere. Because once it's in the can, if you will, uh, the goal here is to get it into the production process, get it edited, get it colored, and move it on. And in the old days, you needed to move this content um, uh, back to your own office, and then you'd be up all night, like uh, uploading content, right? But wouldn't it be great if you could just do all that from the field? Another good use case, and this is particularly uh, noticeable during the pandemic, uh, at home, a lot of us uh, might have very good down uh, load speeds. For example, you might have 100 down, but you might only have 10 up. Very common to have that lower upload speed. What happens if you need to upload uh, a file on deadline and don't have the bandwidth. So that's the problem that we solve. Basically, we have a Mac and Windows application that sits on your desktop and allows you to connect to multiple internet connections. Massive basically takes your enormous files, chunks those files and sends them over all the available connections. And then on the other end, we stitch them back together. Uh, this is wonder, additive bandwidth is kind of the use case I've been talking about here so far where you take multiple connections and get more speed and more bandwidth out of it. But failover is very important here as well. So this is where, hey, one connection goes down or it's kind of dodgy, you know, it will automatically cut over to the another available connection to make sure your transfer gets through. And this is going to be able to remove uh, the complexity of moving files from the field. So let's, let's, you know, we've talked a lot about 5G and often we see use cases of 5G, we kind of conflate using the internet and using 5G. It seems like just more speed. But what's really interesting about 5G and being able to send these kind of remote workflows is, is when you're a deadline oriented professional, um, uh, it, it could be that, you, you know, when you're in the field shooting the movie, you want to get the stuff back to the studio, or maybe you're shooting a sports event or a news item. You want to get that delivered as quickly as possible. So deadlines really do matter. And in that regard, uh, you know, there's budgets available out there to use solutions that can send data uh, more quickly. And we really like this use case. Basically, Massive can be used to unlock burst internet. So you could just connect multiple devices and then blast your files over the web, and then you're going to be able to hit your deadline. So the good news here is that we have already deployed this into a beta of our product, and we've been able to test it thanks to the Encore test bed at Invest Ottawa. So let me just take you through this demo right now. So Starting out, we've got a large file here. As you see, we've got a file of about 20 gigs and we've just pressed send on our upload. You can see I've got about 26 megabits per second and it's gonna take over an hour and a half to get that file delivered. This is exactly what you see in the massive app today. I'm connected to my own home internet via internet cable, but my neighbor has been kind enough to offer me his Wi-Fi password. And look at that, I've almost doubled my connection speed. So that's hasn't quite cut the delivery time in half, but it's dramatically reduced it. The good news here is that I've got this bandwidth doubling here, but I don't have a 5G device. So what we've done here is we've built in the capability to go and browse on the web. Maybe I, my internet provider has got some, a bunch of 5G purchase options available to us. We're just pointing to the OCE site here right now, um, but I could acquire a 5G connection and there's a bunch of different things we could do in the workflow here in the future. Then I could, once I have that device, I could add it here and then send the files and my speed are gonna dramatically improve. And this is a real result. This is not a video that we've edited together. And what you can see is I've dramatically slashed the delivery time on this large file down to 26 minutes. So consider this, like it was an hour and a half before and now it's 26 minutes. This is the amount of time it takes to load the rest of my gear on the truck. So I can upload all this content over 5G and the newsroom could be editing it or my studio could be working on it uh, by the time I get home for dinner. So that really is what we're trying to do here is shorten the delivery time. And uh, we're, this is gonna turn into the world's first multi-connect 5G app. And um, this is gonna uh, be 
combined with uh, an already very reliable and fast massive transfer product, as uh, Liam has already mentioned. Uh, we have an API that is available for other folks to leverage this in different use cases. Um, but the cool thing here is while we're very focused on media and entertainment and getting video delivered on time, we actually connect to a wide variety of different cloud services. So we're able to use this capability as kind of an on-ramp or an off-ramp uh, to cloud services. So if you're in academia or if you're in research uh, or in medicine, you're able to leverage Massive and securely send this content where it needs to go, where it needs to go. So at this point, we're in this really interesting phase where 5G is coming on strong and we're ready to go and commercialize this. Uh, so um, we're, we're working, we're looking for go-to-market partners now to build this out and really start solving some, pro some, some big problems, moving big data for customers. And once again, I got to thank Encore for all the all support and, and work here. This would not have been possible without uh, the Encore program. So with that, that's the story of Massive, and I'm very happy to answer any questions that I can. I can tell you that uh, Massive CTO Majid Al Hadri is on the chat as well, and if there's something that's too technical for me, uh, he'll be able to answer any of your questions. I'll promote Majid if necessary. Greg, amazing story, fantastic story that you have so Thank far, you. I'd like to say as well. It's you're still going, there's still lots of stuff. I also like how you answered most of the questions I had written down already. Like how's the pandemic change your customer base? Uh, what other industries does massive tech have implications for? So I'll ask well, a, let a me, more let fun me talk question about that. for you. Go I ahead. Can I can, I can address that first question because it's actually been very interesting. I, and I think uh, uh, Toby Lucky at Shopify has talked about how the pandemic has moved a lot of the technology adoption horizons forward by a couple of years, right? And um, the same has happened in our business because what you're seeing is um, people who thought, you know what, somewhere down the road, we got to get rid, you know, move away from these on-premises uh, storage devices, right? And so on. They thought, okay, well, maybe in the future we'll do that. All of a sudden they needed it right away. Um, and they're realizing that this problem is here. And when we get files to the cloud, Massa has already solved the problem of being able to send files uh, very quickly and very reliably. Even if you've got a terabyte of data, you know, our app is super, super reliable. Um, however, people will then go, well, okay, that's great, I can, if, but I can't get it to the cloud. I've only got 10 up. How do we solve that? And while I'm kind of joking when I put, you know, Bruce Dickinson on the screen, we were like, why don't we just offer more internet? And honestly, that's what 5G, um, that's 5G's potential, right? A lot of people are now are, are just thinking about getting their first 5G devices. They're wondering, well, you know, what's 5G mean for me? You know, I already just sort of watched Netflix. But when you start looking at these really painful uh, solutions about how do I get really important video on, delivered on deadline when my, my editor is just working from home, um, you know, you're uh, uh, maybe a 5G uh, G dongle or a new phone away from being able to bond these multiple connections and get your files delivered. So, um, you know, I would say that we were really encouraged to push, push this project faster um, because of the pandemic. All right. Amazing, Greg. Thank you. There was one more question in the chat from Arda, who asked if you're familiar with a Waterloo-based company, uh, DeGero, which might be complimentary. I've seen I've seen multiple uh, company uh, I've, I've heard of, yes I've heard of Jujiro and I believe Jujiro and there's another company in the U.S. called LiveU and they're in that kind of hardware bonding uh, space so there's already a proven use case uh, for internet bonding and um, they even work with satellite technology and so forth as well and uh, as we can all appreciate there's a ton of really interesting things happening in LEO satellites and internet connectivity as well. So um, yeah, it, interesting company and uh, we can send files over any number of devices. So that is definitely a potential partnership. All right, amazing, Greg, thank you. Time is up. Next time we'll ask you about what TV shows you've been, your technology has been used on and we'll hear all about Queen's Gambit and stuff like that. But right now uh, we're gonna jump forward to Nick uh, Vanderdunk who's going to tell us about Redlore. Uh, Redlore offers customized IoT solutions in shipment monitoring, cold storage monitoring, warehouse management, and more. Nick, do you want to tell us about how you use 5G and where kind of the supply chain applications of this are going? Yes, thank you, Liam. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, thank you to everybody for joining and give us, uh, giving us this, this audience to talk about what we're so excited about. So I'm Nick, CEO of Redlore. We're an Ottawa-based high-tech company. And 
our mission is to mitigate supply chain losses. And we do that through a marriage of Internet of Things devices with mis machine learning technology embedded into them. So what is the, what is the problem that we're, we're, we're helping to solve? Um, in our supply chains, in our physical movement of goods, we're losing $225 billion worldwide on an annual basis. So $70 billion of that is due to spoilage of food and pharmaceuticals. And mostly here, uh, when we're talking about pharmaceuticals, we're talking about vaccines. $130 billion result from damage, physical damage to the goods and inefficiencies that are introduced by the parties operating in, in those supply chains. And a final $25 billion um, stem from cargo theft. Now, how do we go about in addressing this huge problem? Well, there's a number of, of um, things that we change versus compared to the traditional way uh, of doing things, the, the way that the incumbent technologies um, try to mitigate losses. Um, taking the two first items together, there's package level monitoring, there's end-to-end -end monitoring. A lot of today's monitoring is really done at the level of the vehicle, of the refrigerated truck, the reefer truck. Um, whereas really what, what the, the manufacturer of the goods and also the logistics provider are interested in is end-to-end -end monitoring. Maybe the goods are all good as long as they're in the truck, but then the unloading happens and then the storage in the warehouse uh, occurs. And you really want to know at, every, at any point in time what's happening. Then the two, the two next items here is real-time monitoring and, and predictive. Um, a commonly used technique to, to monitor goods through the supply chain is to put a sensor, USB-based sensor device in a box and upon arrival, you stick the USB device in the computer and you see what happened. So you're able to detect a loss like a temperature excursion, your, your products have become too warm, but at that moment, it's too late to mitigate them. And also you're missing key information at that moment. If you have a real time view, then you know if the goods have received a shock, an impact while they were in the truck, for example, when you're driving on a badly degraded road, if it happened during unloading, or if it happened long after unloading, when the goods were sitting in the warehouse and maybe a forklift has driven in, into them. And that real-time view onto what, what's happening, that is what gives you the circumstance and that gives you the ability to, to remedy the problem and to avoid future similar losses. Predictive monitoring is, is the big rudder of real-time. It uses patterns in the real-time data that you see, it matches up those patterns to data that you've seen and recorded in the past. And it basically predicts what, what's, what's going to happen, what could likely happen with, with the current shipment. And I've left the, the most important one as last, which is a touchless process, a process where we don't depend on, on human interaction. Um, most industry experts agree that more than 50% of the losses in their origin stem from uh, human error and human omission. And it can be something as simple as a shipment label that is ripped off of a package or a pallet while the goods are being uh, moved into the truck, which basically makes this pallet an orphan. Nobody knows what it is, who, who it is for, and where it needs to go. So in our solution, we make everything independent from any manual scans, manual movements, manual operations. So how does it work and, and what's the link to, to 5G? So as you can see here, there's, there's pallets and there's, there's packages and they have this little tag on them, this little red tag. If you can still see my camera, it's, it's a device like this that has all sorts of sensors in them to record things like temperature, humidity, but also a tilt or a fall uh, or a vibration. And they will all form one big network while they're on the truck, while they're on their way. Um, one, one on the shipment, you also have a, a gateway and the gateway and all those tags are constantly communicating with one another. They're constantly sharing data. So for example, suppose you have a shipment with two pallets uh, supposed to be dropped off at the same destination. Accidentally, one pallet is dropped off at an earlier location. 
Well, at that moment, those sensors, they are talking together and suddenly they lose, they lose a connection to all their brothers because those have been uh, dropped off at an earlier location. At that very moment, there will be an event saying this, this shipment was split up, there is a separation. You may wanna uh, call the driver and, and ask him to go back and pick the pallet back up. So the central role of the gateway in this, on this shipment is to assemble all that data from the sensors, do some analysis on it, and then push it over a cellular network uh, through the cell towers to our cloud-based uh, logistics engine. And the technology we use there, the cellular technology, is NB-IoT, um, LTEM, CATM-1, and that also explains um, our, our activity within the Encore 5G program, because it's what the number of unique features of NB-IoT and LTEM is what allows us to give this, to have this real-time connection. Don't forget that uh, trucks are made of uh, metal, it's basically a metal box, uh, reefers, uh, typically have dual layers of, of metal. So it's a big Faraday cage and it's very hard to get the signal out uh, when the doors are, are closed, which is what you want. And thanks to the higher sensitivity offered by these uh, 5G cellular technologies, we are able to, um, in real time, um, uh, have a communication link. From the logistics engine or in the logistics engine, the data is further analyzed, patterns are matched, and the data is sent to uh, a web-based dashboard where data can be analyzed. Um, and also we can send the data directly to our customers, um, enterprise systems, ERP, transport management systems, or what have you. So let's look at a little pre-recorded video here. You see a number of boxes standing on a pallet with this little red tag. Uh, they will go on a journey from Ottawa to Toronto. So during this journey, you can see, you can follow the, the journey on the, on the map uh, in, your, in your dashboard. So they'll, they'll take Highway 7 on their way to Toronto, go back over to 401. They're going to be delivered here. Uh, upon delivery, there is um, a delivery event that auto automatically takes place, no human interaction required. Here there's some, some totes with a, with a sensor attached to them. There's also a gateway not visible on the screen. They're just taken out of the reefer, so you can see on the left, they, they were at seven degrees centigrade moving up now because they're standing in the sun. This is a bit of an accelerated view, so you can see the blue curve, which is the temperature shooting up, and you're gonna attach alarm to that as soon as they, they reach a certain threshold. You're gonna give an alarm, and you're gonna know where that pallet is, and you're gonna put them in, um, in, the, the, in the fridge. This is another type of event, a car or could be a forklift drives into the goods and you see on the dashboard that um, in near real time, a shock and vibration alarm in this case is raised, can be, can, emails can be sent, text messages can be sent as a result. All right, that concludes this very short um, presentation. If uh, Liam will inform us that I didn't use up all my time, I'm happy to take any question. We have time for one question, Nick, and in the chat, we have it from, I believe it's Steve again, uh, and he raised a very good point, something that I've thought about as well. Uh, is Redlore compatible with or a competitor to existing RFID technology? We're, we're very much complementary to RFID. Um, RFID is, um, is a tagging technology is you could say it's it's a more intelligent way of uh, it's a more intelligent form of barcodes. For RFID, you still need um, a a reader. You need a reader to activate devices, and upon activation, devices say, "Hey, this is this is who I am, and this is my my, my status." I think RFID has a very um, big market where it's all about. Um, very large volumes and, and very, very low cost. I think in, in many of the use cases, we are solving end-to-end -end connectivity, independent of infrastructure at the warehouses, independent of infrastructure of at on the, the vehicle. RFID does not solve that use case, and that, that's where we come in. So I think both technologies live next to each other and, and will probably continue to do so. Thank you so much, Nick. It's amazing hearing just what 5G is going to do in so many different industries, supply chain notwithstanding. So thank you. 
That is all your time. And let's jump right into the final talk of today from Rebecca, uh, who's going to tell us all about Area X.0. Rebecca, are you ready to go telling us what's new over there, how 5G is working there, and what else other people can get in talk to, contact with us about? Absolutely. Thanks, Liam. I am just going to prevent here. Give me one second. Looks good over here. Perfect. All right. So what a great event today. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca, and I'm the operations manager at AREX.0. We are very excited um, to have Encore, Encore as part of our communications testing platform. And just trying to get rid of this video, Liam, that's showing up on the side. Um, and you should be able to skip through the slides either way, if you can just click on them there. Sorry about that. No worries at all. Is the video for uh, our, our faces? It is. And are you able to click on the slide to forward it? No, I'm not because the faces are in the road. <laughs> <laughs> Just anywhere on the slide should be able to, to forward it. Okay, perfect. So Ariax.0 has recently been rebranded. It was for, formerly known as the Ottawa L5. Today I'm excited to provide an overview of Ariax.0, our 5G V to X smart city living lab and some of our new assets. Ariax.0, our private test facility that is over 1,866 acres, completely fenced and gated. With the support of our industry partners, we operate one of the most advanced communications test infrastructures in the world. With many GPS systems, 4G private LTE, Wi-Fi, LoRa, TV white space, 5G, including Ericsson's millimeter wave 5G, and satellite communications. We also use band 14, a communication spectrum specifically reserved for first responders. We just recently um, launched a smart farm, which is 100 acres of farmland that brings together autonomous systems, sensors, IoT technologies, telecommunications, big data analytics, robotics, and drones. This smart farm aims to develop, test, and validate smart solutions with respect to agriculture and best management practices. A couple of our new and exciting assets, we now have our own car, a bi-wire enabled Lexus modified by autonomous stuff. This fully functioning automatic vehicle has been designed to act as a research and development platform for SMEs. SMEs can now use the data from the car and also at the same time, test their devices. This is our new mobile 4G, 5G command unit, what we call our ML5. The ML5 can rapidly deploy infrastructure to enable SMEs to test a variety of use cases where solution enablement is not tied to a fixed geographic location. Here's a sneak peek inside our ML5. This command unit is a fully standalone and has secure 5G and 4G network that can be used anywhere, anytime. Housed in a 24 foot sprinter van, the ML5 has been completely customized and includes an extendable antenna for private 4G and 5G, as well as a tethered drone to provide increased height and additional wireless network range of up to 30 kilometers. Additional onboard drones utilize the van's private network to fly and allow for easy mounting of sensors, including cameras, radars, LIDARs, and thermal. The ML5 uses band 14 as well. We also own and operate a variety of drones. One of our key strategic partners, Indra Robotics, has set up a team here in Ottawa to operate these drones. One of the very few vendors that can fly drones out of line of sight. The drones are connected across. Sorry, my phone's going. The drones are connected across the private high-capacity mobile broadband network, ensuring they remain unaffected by congestion in the public network. These drones may also be operated manually if needed, and can be equipped with a suite of cameras or sensors. Some other new assets is we recently installed a smart level railway railway crossing. 
The railway crossing was designed to enable projects that will improve the safety of rail and road systems. This is a very important area of focus to ensure that level crossings can interact and communicate with the road users and connected and autonomous vehicles. The level rail crossing has been constructed to easily onboard and test new technology and devices. We also have two autonomous pod zeros. These are automatic pods and have been designed specifically for first and last mile applications in public areas. We've also acquired three active articulated motorized test targets, a child, an adult, and a cyclist. These mannequins can be used in very precise and specific test scenarios to evaluate the range of the CAV detection systems. The targets are pulled by a track system and synchronized to produce dynamic conflicts between a CAV and the vulnerable road user. The motorized test targets are detectable by radar, infrared, and camera sensors. Our test facility at Ariax.o has been designed to make it easy for us to provide a plug and play system to easily onboard any additional sensors required for use cases and projects. There are numerous locations on the test site and in the smart fields that have power and fiber connection to enable easy sensor connectivity and data collection. We can now do cybersecurity testing as well. We have a license to com for companies to access the BlackBerry Jarvis security tools. Jarvis is a cloud-based binary static application security testing platform. It provides powerful capabilities to examine a complete software product for secure vulnerabilities and software craftsmanship. We also have a quantum resistance code signing server. This server um, offers major protection and further resilience against security attacks. The solution also allows company software to be digitally signed using a scheme that will be hard to break with quantum computer. BlackBerry server uses cryptographic libraries that can protect software of long-lived assets, such industrial controls, aerospace, military electronics, telecommunications, transportation infrastructure, and connected cars. Against an increasingly risky future when quantum computers will be able to easily break traditional code and signing schemes. So those are the few of the new assets that we have at Ariax.o. I would like to invite companies developing groundbreaking technology and services in these sectors to reach out to our team so we can discuss how we might support you in your commercialization. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That is so much information. There's so much going on at Ariadx.o. The link is in the chat, everybody. And I would like to thank you all for sticking around with us uh, for, through all these presentations and learning more about Ariadx.o. I'd like to thank our speakers as well, Greg, Nick, Sebastian, and Dan, and of course our keynote, Amy, uh, from the very beginning, if you remember that, all that fantastic information to go. And we still have so many people online. Again, I just want to say thank you all for sticking with us. Again, a couple minutes over time. There's a lot to pack in today. And if you have any questions about the Encore 5G program, uh, you can visit our website, investottawa.ca slash 5G. Uh, you can check out areax.o and you can learn more about our speakers at their websites, which we will share uh, via email with everyone following up from this. Uh, so please, Check out our survey, check out areax.o, check out the Encore 5G program. Thank you to Encore, Invest Ottawa, and OCE for making this possible. And thank you, last of all, to all of you, again, for attending and sticking with us through the hour. And that is everything for today. Thank you very much, and have a great evening.